case right now. All right. Um, so as you all can see, this is being recorded. Um, so if anyone feels uncomfortable with that, um, go ahead and exit or, yeah, sorry, okay, let me see. Um, thank you all for joining today. Um, we'll just get started in a minute. Okay, um, for any Arabic speakers that are joining us today, um, if you want to listen to this in Arabic, it is being translated live. Um, you just go to the bottom of your screen and hit the globe where it says interpretation. There is no Arabic option. So just select Spanish and that'll take you to the Arabic room and you'll be able to hear everything we're talking about. Nadine, can you please reiterate that in Arabic? I think Alette was going to do that. Sorry, Alette, can you please do that? My bad. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> so, the people who are listening to the Arabic, you will see a sign that is the name of the world, which is interpretations. Go to the Spanish room, you will see the translation of the Arabic in the Spanish room. Thank you so much, Alet. Uh, Lydia. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to go over the guidelines very quickly before the speakers um, speak <laughs> and have their spaces. Um, so first, we are holding this space as a brave space. So if you would like to speak, um, you can either raise your hand um, using the little icons at the bottom or feel free to use the chat to interact with the speakers and what they are saying. Please be aware that this is a brave space. So there might be things that the moderators or the facilitators and speakers may say that can challenge our ideas. And it's important that we use this space to analyze that, challenge us and allow us to grow together and have a conversation about those um, aspects as well. Um, we are not going to censor our speakers. They are free to express themselves in the ways that they feel best, especially when this is a very um, heavy topic. So we are not going to police our speakers, and we ask that our audience also not police them. Feel free to react also to the speakers or have your camera on so that way they can see your facial expressions and also feel like more of an authentic conversation. We have zero tolerance towards hate, so anything that kind of resembles hate, well, it doesn't kind of, that does resemble hate, uh, you will be removed from the space um, so as not to harm anybody in the space. This meeting will be recorded um, and placed on YouTube um, on the Coptic Survivor page. So for anyone who has missed the meeting, they'll be able to catch up via that recording on YouTube. And lastly, we are offering a trigger warning for this conversation. Um, very heavy topic. So we want to be very mindful that there are survivors in this room and that the conversation may be triggering for survivors and um, survivors first and then many allies as well. If you feel triggered at any point in this conversation, feel free to step out and the moderators are watching the waiting room and will be conscientious of people who are leaving and coming back. If there is something that is said that you would like to speak to someone in the Coptic Survivor team. Um, we will post the email in the chat and feel free to contact Sally directly about anything that may have gone in um, 
the meeting that you want to discuss. And we encourage you to seek mental health support when available. And we also ask for everyone to be very mindful when speaking and when asking questions um, and to be present with one another in this space. Lastly, as mentioned, interpretation is available. It is the little globe at the bottom as Elet was saying. Please head into that room right now to receive Arabic interpretation if you haven't done so already. And I'll pass it to the speakers, Nadine. Thank you, Lydia. I just wanna say something real quick before we get started with the speakers. Please keep in mind, our speakers today are all women. They're all survivors. Um, they all have been doing this type of work for a long time. Um, they also have been preparing for this talk for the past few days, pretty much nonstop with me and the team. And I'm very grateful that they're able to join us and share with us their knowledge and wisdom and their experience. And um, so to start, we're gonna have Nadine. She will be going over um, consent in the cultural sense. Then we will go on to Nina Lucas. She is from the Consent Awareness Network. She'll be talking to us about the penal codes and legislative um, issues regarding consent and the law. Um, and then we will move on to Alette, who is going to speak to us about rape and rape culture. And then we have Hanan for mental health support um, and to discuss the trauma behind rape um, later on in the conversation. Hopefully we will be done um, speaking in the first hour or so. For the second hour, we will open up the room. We want an open discussion with you all. We want you to be able to ask questions. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're gonna pass it on to Nadine. Again, this topic is very heavy, rape culture and consent. So um, please feel free to uh, you know, take a step out if you need to and just get some air. Um, we will also have breathing exercises in between each speaker. So we'll be taking breaks to kind of just um, you know, refresh before moving on to the next speaker. So with that being said, Nadine, um, let's get started. Uh, Nadine is um, one of the board members for Coptic Survivor. She is an Egyptian woman. She has been doing human rights um, work and political and civil rights advocacy for many, many years. Um, she also is a survivor and let's welcome her. Thank you, Sally. Um, I wanna just take a moment and have everyone sort of take a deep breath. First, I'd like to invite everyone uh, to make a commitment to listen with an open mind. This conversation is difficult and uncomfortable. It is only through talking through the discomfort that we can hope to find solutions to hard problems. What I'm going to say may be triggering. If you feel your anger is rising, I ask you to take a minute and just remember that I'm a survivor as well. And as a survivor, I don't want anyone to go through what I went through. Oh, this is tough. <clears throat> um, one of my main concerns is to find solutions, to prevent the act before someone is at fault. Prevention, not accountability, is my main concern here. While I completely support those challenging the system to better hold criminals accountable, my job as a human rights defender is to build a just and equitable society. And part of that is to ensure that everyone's rights are protected, including criminals. So I'm obligated to ask myself the hard questions, the unpopular questions. Sexual assault has become too prevalent and too triggering to have these hard conversations. It is easier to place brain. Women blame men for a culture that they had no part in creating. And men blame women for changing the rules of the game without clearly stating the new rules. But if we move away from the egregious assault cases and focus in the space where there isn't malice or intent to harm, I find that there's genuine confusion between the instigator of a sexual advance and the recipient of the advance. And here's where the conversation gets uncomfortable. First and foremost, no matter what happened, what an adjudication or other accountability mechanism could or would find, we always believe the victim. 
And that has nothing to do with blame or judging the instigator or labeling them as aggressor. That means we acknowledge the trauma. The trauma is real, full stop, no questions asked. I believe as a, as a society, we want to fix trauma by finding someone to blame rather than making healing the priority. So we jump to point fingers long before the traumatized are ready, and in some cases, against their wishes. This only serves to create more trauma. Supporting a survivor is of a very different role from advocating for a victim. And judging the accused is also a very different role from both supporting a survivor and advocating for a victim. When talking about consent, we need to remove ourselves from all of these ro roles and put ourselves in the space between an instigator of a sexual advance and the recipient. When we do that, we can begin to talk about this issue with more clarity. As a woman, both as instigators and recipients, we face a society that sexually disempowers us. We are told that men like to hunt, making us prey. And when we take ownership of our sexuality, we're expected to instigate sex. I'm here to say that none of that is true. Not only is each person different, but each interaction is different. And in these multitudes of possibilities, we find we need to find clarity around consent. We also need to acknowledge that sexual arousal and fear both heighten our emotional state to the point that our perceptions are distorted. So as a society, when we're deciding on how to protect the recipient of unwanted advances, we need to begin from a place in which both parties may not be their normal selves. Their reactions by definition may be emotional and exaggerated. Talking about sex is awkward. For most of us, it is the act where we are most vulnerable, making conversation about consent even that much more important. The problem starts with how we talk about consent. No is no puts the onus on the recipient. In most, but not all cases, the woman. She must overcome her fear or her arousal to say no. Now I must pause and I feel the need to clarify. Arousal is not consent. Again, arousal is not consent, neither for a man nor for a woman. Second, saying no means no implies consent unless otherwise stated. In other words, until we say no, we are saying yes. Third, resisting a sexual advance may be part of foreplay. Who doesn't like to be pursued sometimes? So when does a no really mean no? And when does it, keep, and when does it mean keep trying? This leaves too much confusion. We should also remember that in this moment, there are heightened emotions. So a definite no can sound meek from someone who's afraid. This is why we should move away from no means no and to only yes means yes. This puts both the instigator and the recipient of sexual advances on more equal footing. The instigator must ask and the recipient must reply. Of course, there are times when recipients feel pressured to say yes, and times when society pressures them to say no. But this provides an opportunity to have a conversation that may remove confusion and prevent unwanted sexual advances. Bringing me to two points. Sometimes both parties shy away from having a conversation about sex. Men fear opening up the topic too early because they may be perceived as aggressive or worse, called harassers. In the current climate, a man talking about sex outside of a relationship can be extremely aggressive because society does not give women the choice to say yes or no, nor even to open the topic herself. Society tells us women should say no to sex outside of a relationship and are discouraged to say no while inside a relationship. Now, if I flirt with someone, I would of course respect the no and stop but that requires the recipient of my flirtation to say no, even if he feels uncomfortable in rejecting my advances. By empowering women to own their sexuality, 
we give them the power to say both yes or no, and maybe give men the permission to ask rather than have to guess. We must be clear with ourselves. We have the right to say no. Again, we have the right to say that something makes us uncomfortable, but I believe we should treat all advances prior to the no, wanted and unwanted equally. We cannot depend on the other party to pick up on our body language. This leaves too much room for miscommunication and ambiguity favors the powerful and the privileged. For a no to be real, we must feel able to say yes, if we choose. We must be empowered to make that choice. And this is a huge obstacle in our societies, both in Egypt and in the US. I have found that fear of slut shaming is a huge part of the problem. Women are afraid to say yes, and in fact are taught that we must say no to be considered good girls. We are afraid that a man will think less of us if we say yes. This makes a no meaningless because we use it even when we mean yes. So as a society, we have normalized that no can mean no, maybe, or even yes. Leaving up to the instigator of a sexual advance to decide if a no means no or not. In a state of heightened sexual arousal, the instigator is not in an ideal state of mind to make that decision. This is just a recipe for sexual assault. Relationships are complicated enough. Do they like me? Are they ignoring me or just having a bad day? Why haven't we called? What does that look mean? And what does that touch mean? But consent doesn't have to be. We need to give each other permission to have the tough conversations and to ask the difficult questions. We need to own our choices and say, only yes means yes. Nadine, thank you. Um, wow, that was powerful. Um, thank you. I know you've been preparing that. Um, does anyone have any questions for Nadine so far? Um, just Should we do the breathing exercise? Yeah, did you want to did you want to discuss at all like the um what like the cultural issue? Um Yeah, sure, if you want to ask me a question, but for me, I think it is a cultural issue. When we talk, when we move to the legal context for consent, it becomes very dry but it's built on a culture where, for me, like I said, there, whether we're talking in the US or talking in Egypt and even more so in Egypt, there is an understanding um, that sex is supposed to be something that comes without speaking. It's supposed to be a language of the body. And for me, that just leaves so much space for miscommunication. And we're going to talk more about the cultural aspect, I think, uh, in the rape culture. And I don't want to step over Alet's issue in that. But within that context, built within the context of having a culture where a man is more privileged and has um, more authority and is given, you know, the boys will be boys excuse constantly. We have to take a little bit of that back and say, no, I have the right to say yes. And that is very uncomfortable within certain circles. And actually, I find that that is the main problem with consent, is that while we don't have the opportunity to say yes, we really cannot depend on the no to actually mean no. Wow. Yeah, thank you, Nadine. Um, well, yeah, so I know we're, we're addressing this issue globally, um, but uh, we, you know, this did stem from, um, you know, my homeland, Egypt, and, and many others here. And um, 
it is just a completely, from what I've been learning from growing up as an American Egyptian, um, it's just a completely different life for women over there, for children. Um, and it's, 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 there's no way that you're not going to be sexually abused if you're growing up in Egypt as a woman. And it's, just really heartbreaking that that's what we keep passing on. And now it's not only in Egypt, but it's even in diaspora and not only in our culture, our Egyptian culture, but also in every part of the world now. Um, you know, I know we're gonna talk about rape culture in a little bit, but just look at social media, movies, songs. Um, it's really a problem everywhere. It's like being promoted almost <laughs> so. Um, but also, I think hookup culture is part of the problem. Hookup culture within the context where you're not, um, you, you just meet someone and hook up with them. There is no real space for that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and that for me is not just an Egyptian problem. It's a problem everywhere. Mm -hmm. The pressure on a girl to um, engage in acts where she may not necessarily feel comfortable because she has consented to enter a room or enter a space with this gentleman where that's what's expected is part of the problem. And that's part of rape culture for us. Um, and uh, th this is where consent really becomes important. We need to normalize asking the question. Um, so if someone wants to engage in intimate behavior, whatever it is, in any form of touching. I talk about it in, in my discussion about within the context of advances rather than just sex, because any form of, of um, sexual uh, sexualized behavior should be prior to that. We should have a conversation whether we're open to it or not. The second part of that is we should also feel comfortable to say no at any point because we can first meet someone and be very comfortable with engaging with them in a regular conversation and then find ourselves really uncomfortable. We don't normalize saying no. And there's a lot of pressure on a girl to not say no. Um, and so when there's no uh, yes expected and implied consent or negative consent, is what um, is the norm, then it's just, I, I cannot explain how much pressure it is and how much willpower sometimes it takes because a woman can just be just as aroused as a man, but still wanna say no. And that's by the way, even true for men. So, and this is why I say an instigator and a recipient is because the instigator and the recipient may both be very attracted to each other but the recipient may not be in the space. Something may have happened. She may have certain reasons to say no. Uh, chastity could be one of them, uh, but not the only one. And so we don't give permission for people to say no when we don't give them permission to say yes. Yeah, um, and I know we were talking the other day about um, how uh, and I think I is going to touch a little bit more on this in a marriage, um, in some religions and cultures, you can't, as a woman, you can't say no to your husband, um, when he wants sex and the, on the opposite end, it's, uh, when it's a single woman and she's asked, she can't say yes either. <laughs> so, because then she's considered a slut and slut shamed and you know, so the problem is on both ends of the spectrum, whether it's in a relationship or outside of a relationship um, or a marriage. So um, yeah, that's part of rape culture and we'll be addressing that a little bit more in a little bit. So thank you, Nadine. Um, would you please go ahead with the breathing exercise? Um, actually, did we have any questions? I think I saw a hand go up. No, if not- Yeah, it's me. Hi, Sandra. Hi. Um, I have a question. Actually, you mentioned it about the marriage. Do you think some girls are afraid to get married because they don't want to be in that position of pressure to, you know, to comply with their husband's needs, sexual needs? So that's one question. And then the other thing is about um, 
like in the Bible, if we go back to the Bible, like it talks about when you get married, like your body is not yours, it's your spouse's and, and then vice versa for the wife, it's the husband's because the two become one. So then there's pressure to, to comply with your husband's requests. And then when does it become rape? So going back to like Bible, I know this is a lot about law, but then there's the law and then there's the Bible and then whether, you know, okay, what does that mean with respect to Christianity? Am I being a good girl? All that, those questions. Uh, yeah, so thanks, Sandra. Um, yeah, I mean, we are kind of, we are addressing this from a, from the cultural side, from the religious side, from um, the legal side. So we are going to, you know, we are trying to address all the aspects of it. Um, and what was your first question again? I'm sorry. Well, it was about whether girls are afraid to get married. Oh. Like I think in Egypt, like that, there's a lot of women that become nuns and I guess men that become monks too. But do you think women become nuns because they're afraid to get married rather than like really for a desire to be a virgin? Um, that I, I just think that maybe that's the case. Well, a absolutely. Few, you know? Absolutely. I think, I think so. I mean, I think in, in the Coptic um, religion or culture. Yeah. I think that's a possibility. I've, I've heard that before, um, which is not really a reason to necessarily become an un, but I feel like women don't feel another option is possible. So maybe that is a route that they do choose to take. Um, and yeah, I mean, um, I think, I don't know how it works for Islam. Like what, where do women go that, um, don't want to get married. I don't know if there's uh, a place or yeah, but just uh, I mean, what what you're asking about regarding Coptic women and the Coptic religion, I think that could be possible. Virginia. Yeah, I was gonna say um, just anecdotally, like the or if that's a word, but just um, the growing up, I think that was definitely um, a thought that like. That I've had was like, oh, well, I don't want to get married. I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna become a nun. Or I've heard that a lot just like with other, you know, Coptic girls and stuff. So I think that even if that's not something that is like really thought about, you know, like subconsciously, maybe it's a thought of like, well, that's that's an escape. Like that's a way out of like, you know, I have to get up and get, you know, grow up and get married and have a have children and just kind of like the what we see is like the one path that you have to take. Um and I think maybe in some cases like that is that is the case. Um, I did also have uh, kind of a story to share about Sandra's second question. Um, I think that it really depends. I mean, I, I can give you like my religious interpretation just based off of, you know, what I believe spiritually. But I think that um, something that I heard that was kind of interesting was uh, this woman was telling me about how uh, when she was, you know, initially married, um, she was uncomfortable engaging in, you know, sexual activity with her husband because, you know, that was, they were very newly married and she wasn't ready yet, you know, it's just whatever her reasons were, but she just wasn't ready yet. Um, and her husband actually had a priest sit down with her and explain to her that it was um, a part of her duty as his wife to, to be, um, you know, sexually available to him. Um, and that, you know, she was basically not fulfilling her duty as his wife by not doing that. Now, personally speaking, I think that that priest was out of line. Like, I don't agree with that, that logic. I don't agree with that. And I think that was definitely an abuse of power in that situation. Um, and I don't know how common that is. Like, I don't know if that's something that happens often or if, you know, other priests kind of follow that logic. Like, I really, I would like to hear more people talk about that, but um, it's just a story from someone that's very close to me that I've heard that really was kind of shocking. I didn't think that that was, that a priest would ever, you know, be in that context and say something like that, that it was her obligation as his wife to, you know, and I think, you know, because it's in the Bible with what Sandra was saying, how it's, um, you know, your body is his and his body is yours and that kind of thing. Maybe that is an interpretation, but I think there, I mean, the whole point is that the Bible is open for interpretation and that, you know, there are so many different ways to interpret the words that are written. And so, I just personally don't believe that that is one of the interpretations, but it's crazy to me that the priests would kind of, or that particular priest would push that narrative um, onto the woman like that. But I definitely would like to hear more people talk about that. Thank you, Virginia. Um, that's very interesting. I do believe that um, in, actually, I'm not gonna comment. 
but maybe someone knows better than me, but I, my understanding is in a marriage, whether it's a Coptic marriage or Orthodox Christian or um, a Muslim marriage, I think sex is part of that unless it's agreed upon otherwise prior to entering the marriage. So if a couple um, chooses that they're going to live a life of celibacy, I think that's something that should be discussed prior to entering a marriage, um, just to be fair to both sides or um, for everyone to be on the same page. Like you don't want, that's just a huge, enormous conflict of interest in a marriage. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's just my two cents response um, to that. Can I just comment about just a few things? First of all, um, in regards to girls going into monasteries uh, just from personal experience it's a very rough road so <laughs> if um if the perception is that they're going in because it's easier or it means that they don't have to have sex or anything else um the the convents are very very selective at least in the coptic church so it's not that easy to get in and it's a very rough road i can understand the perception that some girls may have or some people may have that this is an option to get out of marriage. Uh, but there are lots and lots of women in Egypt and around the world that have chosen neither to marry nor to go into monasticism or to become deaconesses. But I can assure you um, it's not easy to get in and it's certainly not an easy option. They don't make it an easy option and there's a lot of hurdles and there's many, many years of... Uh, of, of having to wait and go through many things in order to be allowed to stay. And you can stay for up to seven years, three years, and then be told you have to leave. So the general perception and the reality is maybe a little bit different. In regards to um, the comments made about the priests telling women about their husband's rights, um, is not uncommon, but I think there's now, it's beginning, there's, be, there's a start to more education um, for couples generally around the, the world, at least in the Coptic church, I'm not sure in Egypt, but even in Egypt, um, there are premarital courses, but culturally speaking, I don't believe women, girls, families talk enough about the realities of marriage and what's expected. Uh, yes, they throw the book or the Bible, I should say, at women about the rights of men. But um, I think I started to have this conversation with you, Sally, about Corinthians and about um, couples having to agree um, to have or not have sex. Um, and I think that needs a session of its on its own to sort of explore in more detail. Um, and also I sent you an article that I think is worthy of including that in those discussions in the future because I think it's a twofold process one of raising awareness and the other education and also being aware of what historically has happened and where the future and new generations will be going with this thanks Let me unmute myself, folks. Um, thank you, Hanan. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's right. I also, uh, I don't think we've mentioned this yet, but, and I, we're not gonna go into it today, but I also am aware that um, there are uh, Copts that are, um, they discover their sexuality is, you know, maybe they're homosexual and there's no place in the church for, homosexuals um, or in many religious institutions. And so they feel that that is also maybe their only choice is to go become a monk or a nun. And that's really sad. And we'll talk about that another time um, with people that can educate us uh, better on it. Um, just wanna read Virginia's comment. She's saying, I think it's more of the idea that young girls think that those are the only two options or that if you don't want to get married, you need a valid reason. Um, I'm 35 and single and that's like expired in our culture <laughs> and it's, you know, I get asked all the time, like, when are you going to get married? It's like, it's, it's as if like, I haven't fulfilled my full, um, 
uh, like requirement as a woman or something. So yeah, I'm going to get married when I get married and it is what it is. Um, so moving on, I want to get to um, Nina in a second. Can we just all take a deep breath? Nadine, can you walk us through the breathing exercise? And then we'll move on to Nina. Nina is from the Consent Awareness Network, and she's going to talk to us about the legal side of consent next. Okay, so let's take a moment. I know this is a tough conversation. We're going to quickly just inhale in three seconds, exhale in, th uh, uh, sorry, hold for three seconds, exhale in three seconds, and then hold for three seconds a few times. So inhale, exhale, uh, sorry, hold, exhale, Hold, inhale, hold, exhale, and hold. And I think we're ready for Nina now. Thank you, Nadine. Nina, welcome. Hello to everyone. Thanks, Sally, for inviting me to join this panel. I am honored to be included today. My name is Nina Lucas, and by way of background, I am an Orthodox Christian. My father and uncle are Orthodox priests, and my godfather was our diocesan metropolitan. Years ago, my family was Eastern Catholic, and for many years, my father took on the role of whistleblower, meeting with officials and hierarchs within our diocese in an attempt to inform them of the abuse of power and sexual abuse that was occurring among his brother priests. And sadly, after years of being ignored and ridiculed, our family fled to the Orthodox Church. So the mission of Coptic Survivor is very near and dear to my heart. When something bad happened to me, I sought out legal counsel to learn how I could pursue justice. I ultimately learned that because of the way the laws are written in my state, I could not ever hope to achieve that justice. This ultimately led me to the work that I do today because I don't want what happened to me to happen to anyone else. Today, I'm inviting you to think about consent in a truly transformational way. I currently serve as Chief of Staff for the Consent Awareness Network. Our mission is to educate society as to the correct definition of consent and to legally define it in our laws as freely given, knowledgeable and informed agreement. Uh, we use the hashtag FGKIA. We've assembled a coalition of consent crusaders that includes plaintiffs and survivors of Bill Cosby, Harvey Weinstein, Russell Simmons, Marilyn Manson, reproductive fertility fraud, and even the Nexium cult. Currently, there is no legal language anywhere in the world that correctly defines the noun consent. Freely given, knowledgeable, informed agreement. We are provided this definition through language present in significant legal sources. Model Penal Code, which was established by the American Law Institute in 1962. General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, a European Union initiative which prevents, excuse me, protects internet privacy, as well as Nuremberg Code, which was written in response to Nazi atrocities and why we all signed consent forms for our COVID shots. Each establishes that consent is freely given, knowledgeable, informed agreement. Now, consent is a noun with a definition. To consent is a verb, an action word. In order to consent or to convey agreement, the underlying concept of the noun consent must be present. So establishing a yes means yes or affirmative consent statute saying yes, that model is problematic because that legal language does not consider all the potential malice an offender might use to elicit an agreement. Simply put, if a perpetrator employs malicious influence, such as force, fear, fraud, coercion, or exploitation of incapacity, 
that agreement is not consent, no matter what the victim said or did. Saying yes under those conditions would be either assent, agreement on the face of it, which would occur in fraud, or acquiescence, which is agreement under duress, but it would definitely not be consent. Consent is a very special type of agreement and the influence in the inducement must always be considered. Our laws do not fully incorporate this vital concept. Instead, they focus on describing the conveyances of agreement, not the actual agreement that must be present for cons consent to occur. And offenders know <laughs> all they need to do is to conform to the law and get their victim to say yes, no matter how that agreement was influenced. The issue present today in so much penal code is focused on the victim rather than the offender. Victim blaming and shaming is not just a societal outrage. It remains so difficult to eradicate because such practices and attitudes are actually encoded in our laws. Any legal language that looks to the words and actions of the victim, what they said or did, is born out of a toxic perspective. Something that the victim said or did or said or didn't do is a determinant of whether or not the offense has occurred. That's how it works in our law currently. Rather, people of goodwill understand that it is solely the behavior of the perpetrator that constitutes whether or not a crime has taken place. Establishing FGKIA in our laws will immediately take away the ability of law enforcement and defense attorneys to pick apart victims with questions regarding what they said, did, wore, or malign their personal histories. The focus will rightfully be placed where it belongs, on the offender. It will encourage investigations and legal procedures that will determine if any malicious influence has taken place. The Consent Awareness Network's work has led to the introduction of New York Bill A6540A, which seeks to define consent as freely given, knowledgeable, informed agreement. It is the first piece of legislation anywhere that will correctly define consent. What's more is that the bill has been introduced in general law, which means it will pertain to the 162 times consent is mentioned in New York Penal Code, all without a definition, even though basic words like person and office are defined. And for example, even New York's arson laws contain the word consent. Consent is everywhere in our law without a definition. Attempts to properly define consent in purely the sexual assault domain is legally incomplete because the definition of consent is always the same and never changes. It applies equally in the bedroom, boardroom, operating room, and playroom. In our modern world, we recognize that every individual is entitled to their bodily autonomy and personal agency, and to be protected from the bad actors that seek to induce compliance through malice. We must bring our statutes into the 21st century and change our penal codes to reflect this paramount truth. Properly defining consent in the law is truly a human rights issue. Movements like Me Too, Time's Up, and It's On Us have brought society recognition and enlightenment about the scourge and prevalence of sexual assault. We can continue to speak up and out, tell our stories, march in protests, but in the words of the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, nothing changes until we change our laws. Our morality shapes our laws and our laws shape our morality. And to that point, I have an action item for everyone today. We are working with several state and federal legislators in an attempt to change our laws. And the drafting of numerous bills is in progress. If we can support New York Bill A6540A and legally define consent there, it will echo throughout the halls of justice, really, paving the way for duplicate legislation to be drafted and pushed through in other states. And toward that end, may I ask that wherever you live in the world to sign and share our petition for the New York bill. Share our posts and has hashtags, FGKIA and codify consent. Reach out to the Consent Awareness Network for assistance in contacting your individual legislators. Most importantly, contemplate on the importance of getting this legal definition right. A definition that will direct examination of the perpetrator, not the victim. Currently, we're not protected. But with consent legislation, activism, and education together, we can make the world a safer place. Thank you. Amazing, Nina. Thank you. Amazing Thank you. work you're doing. Um, we do also have a legal professional um, with us. If anyone has any legal questions, um, uh, 
to help Nina out as well. Um, wow. So uh, when Nina approached me, I can't even believe that I never even thought that consent was not defined in law. Um, just to share a personal um, uh, story of mine, I'm actually a three time sex assault survivor and um, the third one uh, was a rape in college. It was my first time drunk, blacked out, did not know my limit, blacked out. Um, and someone broke into, someone followed me home. And after I was completely blacked out in the safety of my own home, I did, uh, I was responsible and I had a, a designated driver and my friend and I were dropped off at my apartment, completely blacked out once I got there. Um, and someone followed us home and broke into my apartment after our designated drivers left and came into my room and raped me while I was blacked out. And I woke up um, eventually uh, after a lot of, assault, of the assault had already taken place. And um, he confessed to the entire thing. I asked, you know, what are you doing here? I didn't let you in. He confessed to the entire thing. Um, later on, he continued to I, I went and got a rape kit, everything, did everything. I reported as soon as I could, I pressed charges. We went through, um, we started an investigation. I cooperated with the entire investigation. Um, we ended up, he was harassing me. Somehow he got my contact information. He was al also a student at the college that I went to, but I'd never met him before. Um, and he started to call and harass me and beg not for me not to go to the police. He wasn't aware that I'd already reported him. And so I got an entire full confession recorded um, with the police. So it was a legal recording. Now, his attorney fought for five years to have that recording thrown out. We went to trial and <laughs> he was found not guilty because apparently somehow the defense convinced the jury that it's possible in a blackout that I may have mumbled something or shown some sort of sign of consent in my complete blackout. They didn't even deny that I was blacked out. And so they put that doubt in the jury's mind that it's possible I could have consented while I was completely blacked out and he was found not guilty. And so now I'm just finding out that consent is not even defined. So how could that jury have even come to the conclusion um, according to legal code and definition um, without it being defined? So I just yeah. wanted to mention, um, as I said, we work with survivors and plaintiffs in the Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein matters. They are um, on board with us and um, they're working to um, appear when we have meetings with legislators to tell their side of the story. In both cases, the jury, um, when they were deliberating, came to the judges and asked them, what is the legal definition of consent? Pennsylvania was Cosby, Weinstein was New York. In the Cosby case, um, it's in the transcripts, uh, Judge Stephen O'Neill said, that is a question that cannot be answered. And in the Harvey Weinstein case, um, uh, Judge Burke said, use your common sense. Um, it's really, again, astonishing that, um, you know, we have statutes and penal code full of the word consent. We're, you know, hearing it everywhere. It's a hashtag. Um, you know, there's all kinds of social media presence about it, but, um, you know, this is not properly defined in the law. So um, what we need to do as a matter, of, even of the 14th Amendment, where we're all um, entitled to equal protection under the law, is get this important term defined. And um, it will apply in every instance the consent is mentioned if it's introduced in general law, and it will um, seek to um, educate society and uh, protect um, and even prevent uh, sexual assault. Because as I said, predators know very well what the legal loopholes are and they slither in and out of them um, you know, accordingly. So I, I also wanna point out Sally, you know, it's funny. Um, it's not funny. That's not what I meant to say, but it's just an expression. Um, we can't sign uh, legal contracts 
if we are inebriated or if we are, you know, in the middle of an incapacity. Um, I think it's very, very telling that, you know, um, our bodily autonomy um, is something that could be, as they did in your case, negotiated with the jury. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. We have lemon laws, you know, for cars, if um, in, in cases of fraud, you know, if the odometers turn back, we have legal recourse. But if there's fraud present in um, sexual assault, um, it doesn't matter <laughs> because there's no protection for that. So that, that's why I was saying we've got to bring our laws into the 21st century to reflect what we know is uh, correct and ethical and moral. And then we'll be able to, when we define consent properly, work uh, better with consent education because by the way, in consent education, although a lot of what is moral and ethical and, and makes sense is, is discussed, a lot of consent education, what is in there is not reflected in our laws. I mean, you know, in some states, um, you know, you being drunk is okay, okay, or, or blacked out, it's perfectly fine. The, there's, there's no um, defense against that, or, or rather, you know, it doesn't work out for the victim. In some states, it's okay if your uh, husband rapes you, that is perfectly legal. So that's why we have to understand that every individual is entitled to their personal agency and bodily autonomy. And this is why we're seeking to codify consent in the law as freely given, knowledgeable, informed agreement. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Nina. Um, yeah. Thank you for shedding light on that for us and for me personally. And it's no wonder that cases like mine um, end up losing. And, you know, it's no wonder that someone like Predator Bill Cosby is out free. Um, it's insane. And all because of technicality in the wording of the laws. So it's crazy. Um, Sarah Bullis, you've had your hand up for a while. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this conversation, Nadine and Nina. Really informative. I just wanted to ask Nina where we can find that petition to sign for the law so we can share it. Um, I what I could. Oh. I just put it in the chat. Sorry. Go ahead, Nina. Oh, cool. I was just going to say, I'm happy to add it to the chat, but that's great. And again, no matter where you live in the world, you can sign it and it will, um, you know, assist, assist in our cause. So we would really appreciate if uh, everyone could take a look at it and perhaps even share it. That would be great. Thank you. Nina, is this, so we're, so this is just for one state, right? For New York. Right. Then because right yeah, right now, uh, New York is the only state where this this uh, bill's legal language is pending. Um, we're hoping to hear soon from Pennsylvania. We've been doing a lot of work there. Uh, New Jersey is saying that they're wanting to introduce one. And um, by the way, where we find uh, legal um, pushback, if you will, are from defense attorneys and their political action committees. Um, but we always want to remind everybody that legislators are the people that make our laws. Uh, not lawyers. <laughs> so a polite reminder uh, there. So um, that's basically where we get our, our biggest pushback. Thank you, Nina. Anybody have questions for Nina before we move on? We're good. Awesome. Thank you so much. Nadine, can we get a breathing exercise, please, to refresh before we move on to Alette, my beautiful friend? Yes. Okay, everyone, um, let's uh, <clears throat> take a deep breath in. This will be slightly different. So please take a deep breath in, this time with your eyes open. I want you to focus on a color or something in front of you, visual. And as you breathe in, focus deeper. Now notice any shifting color, notice a light. Notice the shades on this fabric or whatever it is you're looking at. In your head, mention the color. Say it's getting darker, it's getting lighter. Just for a 10 second beat, envelop yourself into this color. Now take a deep breath in, hold, and exhale. Thank you. Go ahead, Sally. Thank you so much for that, Nadine. I know I needed it, so um, thank you all. 
Alette is next. Uh, Alette is a life coach and she's going to talk to us about, and she's a survivor as well, proud survivor. And she's gonna to talk to us about rape culture now. So take a deep breath, everybody, get ready. Um, I wanna to apologize to our interpreter. I know we're going really fast, so I apologize. I know you're trying to keep up and translate Arabic live. So um, thank you so much. I apologize, we will try to slow down. Alette, you have the floor. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to slow down. Uh, first of all, before I start, I want to let you know that I'm live on Instagram. So if you want to join the live, uh, you can join now. Um, well, Nadine, thank you so much for the breathing exercise. I was getting already nervous and it helped a lot. Um, I would uh, love to start off with the story that I sent you, Sally, and this would be the very first time for me to, um, to publicly talk about this and um, to, to say it publicly. So um, in 2019, I took myself out to be able to write this down, to show myself love and definitely reconnect to the fact that I'm still valuable. Bear with me. I, it, took, um, it took me almost 21 years of what I can remember of physical and verbal sexual abuse to be able to put this in a sentence to my therapist. I have been physically and verbally sexually abused that the word sex for me can only be associated with abuse, I said. It started when I was five or six, as I remember, when I was physically sexually abused. I was standing outside my neighbor's house, knocking on the door, but there was no one inside. Then showed up a delivery man who started talking to me. Then it happened. I was taught by my parents back then that no one is allowed to touch me at a certain place. They are loving and caring but they were strict too. When it happened, I was scared to tell anyone because I was too worried. They would not let me go to play with my neighbor's place again. On February 5th, 2019 was the last incident back then when I wrote it, a kid and definitely it happened again after. I was walking on the street. The pervert was on a motorcycle. He did it so quickly and aggressively that I froze. And I couldn't do anything. It was physically painful for three days of constant pain. And be sure as hell, it was psychologically as painful as having to die every second by the beast that lives within. Helpless I felt, I felt helpless, weak, I felt worthless, I hated myself. I felt like he pressed rewind and made me li relive every single time I was sexually harassed again, every single time. I told no one that day. I was too angry then to talk and definitely I couldn't handle any sexist or patriarchal shit. Excuse my language. Also, then I couldn't handle any stupid overprotective shit done out of love. And yes, it would have been out of love. The very next day, I was absolutely terrified to even get out of my own room. But I pulled myself together and I actually walked again to help myself get over the fear of walking on the streets, terrified to the bones, but I walked. It's not only that day, it happens every day. Even if it does not, I see it coming every day. I would be walking and see it happening without it actually happening. I hear it being said without them uttering a word. Um, this is a, a little bit heavy, so um, maybe I'll get back to this story later, but let me explain what rape culture is. 
um, a very, very basic explanation of rape culture. It's where it's a society where sexual abuse or sexual assault is normalized. Um, why is it normalized? Um, statistically, in Egypt, 98% of women are subject of sexual abuse, whatever it is, if it's verbal, if it's physical, um, any type, but I kid you not, I bet my life that any woman, any Egyptian woman that you know um, or you have seen um, was a subject of sexual abuse. So um, that's in Egypt. In the United States, um, only 6% of all reported rates land in prison, only 6%. Combined with the relatively um, very, very low amount of reporting, this makes 99% of rapists get away with it. Um, two factors that uh, perpetuate this to be normal. One, rape is a very, very personal crime. So it's almost impossible to prove. Um, eight out of 10 rapes happen between acquaintance. As scholars say, it's acquaintance rape. Um, so it makes it more difficult to actually accuse a family member, a friend, or a colleague. Um, Another factor would be um, the victim blaming attitude, which lands um, us victims into, actually it feels the same as being raped or being sexually abused or assaulted. It feels the same. Um, having someone question the honesty of your story or question your presence somewhere um, is a killer. So basically most of survivors, they choose not to talk about it and not to report. Um, rape is a, a crime of a kind where actually the victim's body is the weapon used against them. So um, it leaves the, the victim with extreme psychological pain where the victim actually um, would start blaming themselves. Um, Also, uh, the, 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 the scenario or the, the very common scenario that uh, rapists are generally sexually frustrated men is severely harmful because it has a huge impact on the nature of the crime. You're basically giving a justification for this crime. Um, this, despite uh, the, the, the all, all the significant uh, clear studies that says that rape is a crime about uh, power uh, and control, many people choose to believe that it's driven and motivated by sexual impulse. So um, I think, I can't remember who exactly was, uh, was saying that, um, we, we, we choose to, to believe another side of the story and to justify it. Um, it also, uh, and unfortunately, implies that women cannot rape, which is not true. But talking about uh, numbers, um, they're a bit out of comparison. 
but it's real and um, it happens that women rape. Um, and it also implies that women cannot perpetuate sexual violence in any way or another, which is not true. Uh, basically, we are undereducated when it comes to sexual situations. We're undereducated about consent, and um, very, very few now um, start educating their kids about consent and about saying no and allowing them to say no. So it starts. Uh, from a very early stage where you enforce your child to kiss this grandpa or hug this uncle or you have to kiss them and we've been very very well trained and programmed that um, this enforced type of intimate gestures um, are a way to show love um, another thing would be um, actually the, um, the religious part. Um, unfortunately, I would, I would talk about Egypt specifically because I know that we are a male dominated patriarchal society that has been very, very well supported false, by false religion. So um, a woman cannot say, no is a myth it's not it's not real in islam um marriage in islam is all about kindness and mercy and basically peace so and this is how it's stated in quran the 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 myth about the woman not being able to say no is is just um, a way to impose power on women and forcing them um, to do to have a sexual activity if they don't want. Um, I have a personal story. Um, my ex and I we were discussing a very famous um, rape incident that happened in Egypt and um, he started questioning her presence in this place and I went like wherever she is um, this does not justify the crime so um, I made it clear in the discussion and it was a very intuitive reply I told him uh, when we get married even if I'm in the room, utterly naked. And I said that I don't want, it's a no. So he, he replied in, in, in a very sarcastic way, read. I was like, yes, this relationship has ended like three days later, <laughs> thank God. So uh, <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's actually, I'm, I'm smiling and laughing about it, but it breaks my heart that the man I love, he valued his, his desires and um, his, his power much more than my humanity. And um, he would actually want evidence for me to, to, to be allowed to say no. So it's, it's, it's heartbreaking and it puts a lot of pressure on women um, to be the good girl or uh, to be loved by God or accepted. So um, it is about time to, um, to talk more and it's okay to talk whenever we want to talk and louder and louder as we uh, agreed, Sally, this is all what we can do now. Uh, we keep on learning because I think five years ago, I knew nothing about this, absolutely nothing. So we keep on learning and listening more and uh, teaching what we have to teach. Um, for me and my story, 
I, I'm a victim, yes, but I'd rather um, remove the, 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 the shame of being a victim and talk about it. And uh, I'm a survival and proud, and I would say it wherever I want and whenever I want. And it's always, always, always about the survivor. Um, I think Nadine was talking about how we uh, defend the survivor, um, even if it's against their will, which is something that I personally fell for because I always thought that you should report and you should take an action for your own self and to protect other women. And you should do this and you should do that. And then, Someone taught me that, no, it's not about what you think is right. It's always about the victim and what they want. Because if you force them to take an action out of love again, which is uh, I'm doing the same thing that I was trying to avoid differently, acting stupid out of love, um, she will be scared. And Later, she wouldn't talk about it and she will teach other women not to talk about it because maybe they too are forced to fight for something that they don't want to fight for. Um, so we should feel no shame. We should not allow predator, predators to continue to perpetuate uh, violence in our lives by keeping us silent. This is for me, this is for whoever can speak. Um, and you definitely see the manifestation of rape culture in everything around us, everything and everyone. And uh, it happens on a daily basis. Um, in the United States, um, there is a study that shows that every 98 seconds, a woman gets raped every 98 seconds. So uh, we should work hard on building a society where rape is discouraged, um, that potential rapists would never think of acting it out. And um, yeah, um, and sexual violence would rather be uh, discouraged and it wouldn't be encouraged by being justified as a, a sexual impulsivity or, or actually they wouldn't act out because they know that they would get away with it. Uh, they should know that they wouldn't get away with it and it's not it's not about me talking about it or you or everyone should talk about it. They should be frowned upon. They should be named and they should be uh, publicly shamed. Uh, so I go for name and shame all the way. Um, women should be, and this is between us women actually before men, and it's not a fight. It's it's you you know your rights and you start acting upon them. So um, especially in the in the Middle Eastern countries, uh, women should be valued for their contribution in the in the society and um, in in this world because we have a huge impact rather than for their sexual purpose. And also uh, the concept of masculinity uh, shouldn't be directly proportional to sex and power because this is how it is on both sides. Um, we should unlearn also the, the, the program that, that has been planted in us. And it's so much more difficult to unlearn than to learn. So if I've been trained um, that 
ever since childhood in this, I've heard this like a million times that a woman cannot say no to her husband. Unlearning this is a process. It's not easy as learning it. And uh, actually I would highly recommend that uh, the first exposure to the coming generations would be uh, nothing of what we've been exposed to because uh, mostly our first exposure is either by families that know nothing about consent um, or friends or um, some of some of us their first exposure ever is to sex is pornography and um, yeah I hope that the first exposure would be something educational and uh, something that is right uh, rather than them learning uh, and having to unlearn this program. Um, I wrote this down in points so that I wouldn't forget anything. Uh, scholars say that we live in a rape prone society, um, the culture of sexual violence against women is so embedded in us that we forgot that it's even there, which is true. And um, yeah, what triggered me today so much during this talk is actually realizing how many survivors am I talking to right now? It's heartbreaking. And I wouldn't have guessed that any of you is a survivor because it's normalized. Um, we um, usually define sexuality in terms of power and obligation. And this is the one thing that we need to unlearn. Uh, rapists are not born rapists and we are not born accepting rape. Um, it's, um, it's a construction by the, the society and uh, the sociocultural attitudes that shape this identity, the identity of a rapist, someone who can do this and someone who can be actually violent in any way or another. Um, talking about sex, whether it's sex normally or um, sexual assault is very uncomfortable. It's not normal, but this is exactly when you know that you should talk more about it and discuss it more. So uh, tell your story proudly. I'm saying my story proudly and thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much for, for giving me the space to talk about this uh and the support i feel very comfortable talking about this here with you uh and actually the other people that i've i've been having live um so tell your story proudly or um, i hope that uh, one or two women that are listening that are not uh survivors of sexual abuse if you're not one then use your voice to help someone and um, always be the voice of someone who cannot talk about it and yeah this is it thank you very very much oh one more thing um and um i think it's um it's common but uh, it's not put, uh, put in words. I wish that I would have had invested this energy and effort to grow and be pr productive fearlessly, rather than having to heal from unjustifiable crimes. Thank you very, very much. Wow, we're gonna need a, a good breathing exercise after that one. <laughs> yes. I, I need it too, <laughs> I need it too. <laughs> We will, we will. Sending you so much love. That was very courageous of you to share. Thank you so much. Um, love you, girl. I, I'm so happy that, I mean, 
on such ugly circumstances, I'm happy that we've crossed paths, uh, me and the speakers and the team and all of you here today. Um, this is not a coincidence. This is, you know, I'm gonna, we don't really touch on religion too much in these rooms, but um, this is called Coptic Survivor, but I am so proud of us for all coming together from different parts of the world and different faiths and backgrounds and religions and trying to understand each other and work together towards ending sexual violence or preventing it at least. Um, this is huge. And I wanna point out that um, I do believe that God is leading this movement, um, at least in my journey, that is my belief. That's how I feel, that's my faith. And um, I believe that God never left me for a single moment and has prepared me for this my entire life. Um, and I don't know if anyone else here feels the same that does this kind of work that we're doing now, but I also can't help but notice that within, I think the same week, um, that the Coptic survivor movement started. We actually, uh, it was started on the early morning of July 12th, 2020. And the Egyptian Me Too movement was started on July 1st, 2020, just days before. So, um, oh, can we mute the, what's going on? Moderators. I don't know who's laughing. Are we okay thank you sorry guys um yeah so i was saying that uh i don't think it's a coincidence i think that um this moment has been a long time coming um i think that since the start of the egyptian me too movement and the uh coptic survivor movement with just within days apart i think that um, we've done so much in coming together and networking and let you and I have been working together, um, you know, and, and speak up and assault police and uh, so many great activists. We had Shadi Noor with us last month for last month's talk and Salim who used to work with assault police and um, cat calls of Cairo, Zaina. I mean, we have, there's just so many powerful people. I can't even remember everyone. Malak Bordedi, I think um, uh, Nadine knows, you know, uh, Nadine has been in this game too. And we're just, it's been so amazing the work that we've been able to do to actually have Egypt recognize and um, hold abusers accountable for the first time really. Um, on such a large scale, not, I mean, we're still, we still have a lot of work to do, but a lot larger scale than ever before in history. So um, I'm just so grateful that we've all crossed paths from all different parts of the world and especially my Egyptian brothers and sisters. And I thank you all for being in this fight um, with me and all together. Um, Nadine, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to to touch a bit on on what what rape culture um, the space that it provides isn't just that it's sexualized violence, but its effect on all effects, not just women, but its effect on men is just as problematic. So men who do not want to sexualize. Uh, uh, or don't want to, sorry, use violence within the context of their sexuality, their engagement, or even um, their sexual advances. Um, rape culture is a problem for them as well, because it creates a sphere, um, it, it creates a sphere where fear is the way and the space in which we engage. So rather than coming from a place of really trying to explore each other or understand each other or engage each other um, in conversations that are coming from love, which what I feel is the core of this kind of intimate space, we're coming from a place of fear. So our first interaction with a man generally becomes quite fearful and that creates a huge obstacle for engagement. This means that a guy who wants to come up to me in the street and just say hello would have a problem because my first reaction and quite justifiably would be, oh my God, why are you talking to me? 
So we need to look at rape culture as a systemic problem and its effect on women is extremely problematic. We go out of our houses afraid to dress normally, looking to cover ourselves and protect ourselves constantly which does not allow for the open space in which we are able to have these conversations about consent and makes these conversations so triggering. Yes, um, yeah, definitely, 100%. Thank you, Nadine. Um, all very good points. I know that this is not just a, a problem in Egypt. It's a way bigger problem in Egypt, you know, just walking down the street and get groped, grabbed, harassed, abused. <laughs> um, but this is everywhere, even in America. I mean, we have, it's like promoted almost in rap songs and in, you know, different um, songs and movies and in social media. And it's almost like expected if you walk out and you're wearing the wrong type of clothing that you will get uninvited attention. Um, actually, I have a friend of mine in this room and uh, he sometimes is like, how do y'all do it? How do y'all women do it? Just go out every day and you have, you know, you face these people that are hitting on you or just, you know, it's like, I'm not, how do you deal with that every single day? Um, and again, it's almost like it's normalized, not only in Egypt, but everywhere. And I think that's, that's got to change. Um, and it starts with us having these conversations. So that is the reality that we're in right now. Uh, we have John with his hand up. Hi, John. Hello. How are you? Thank Good. you How for allowing me to. Thank you for allowing me to join. So to join, this can't be easy for you all. So uh, I thank you for your bravery and your willingness to share to help us address these uh, important matters. So a bit about my perspective. I'm a typical Coptic Orthodox guy born and raised in New Jersey, just outside New York City. When I first heard about these abuse allegations within like our church regarding priests, I was reluctant to immediately believe it without some type of proof or documentation. And I was told, hey, check out Sally's Facebook. And sure enough, there was proof and plenty of it. And to be honest with you, um, and just to backtrack a little bit, when the whole sex abuse situation had happened in the Catholic church, you know, followed all that. And I said, thank God I'm Coptic Orthodox. Cause that would never happen in our church. Thank goodness. So Sally, I guess this question is directed to you. So I, I wanted to understand from your perspective, where do we stand regarding our church and proper accountability and who specifically is hindering this ability for us to have accountability um, regarding uh, the victims. And I have a second question after that. I'd really appreciate your understanding. And I think a lot of people who I've talked to regarding this, you know, in different churches, they kind of all have a very similar perspective and no one's really clear on, hey, this is terrible, but what's our church doing about it? And it's kind of like, um, we never really got an explanation uh, or understanding, despite the fact that the documentation is actually signed by the hierarchy of the church, but yet there's no explanations as to uh, what steps were taken to prevent this from happening and um, accountability for the people who were involved in these horrendous uh, abuse situations and, and uh, as well, the people who were covering up just as just as terrible. Um, yes, thank you, John. Um, good question. Um, Y'all may have noticed that I was laying low in most of 2021 um, because it just got really too much on me uh, in the start, um, 2020 from July until I think at, towards the end of the year, I just was a machine nonstop and it, I mean, I hit a brick wall and I needed a timeout and it was really good for me um, because part of hitting the brick wall was realizing that the problem is all the way at the top. And I've been sharing uh, multiple times I've posted about Pope Caladros and that's just not, it's not just hate speech or um, misdirected anger or anything like that. It's actually Pope Caladros that is stopping 
any accountability from uh, from moving forward and 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 preventing this from happening. Um, I've spoken to multiple bishops. Um, I've spoken to clergy in private and secret, and they do not want their identities revealed. And if their identities are revealed, they could be at risk of God knows what. And uh, they've been honest with me, and or at least from what I'm gathering, um, is that they don't really have any power and that it's all up to Pope Tawadros. Um, and Pope Tawadros is the one that is instructing all bishops and clergy to number one, be silent, two, obey, three, submit. So that's the instructions from the top down, from the Pope down to bishops, down to priests, is be silent, obey, and submit. And so I don't understand where they've lost sight of their first love, God himself, their actual boss, God himself. Um, that's just not... I don't know what kind of cult where this has turned into, but it's not, um, it does not know God or Christ when, when a leader, uh, especially members of the Holy Synod, the most powerful bishops that do have the power to stand um, together, band together and approach the Pope and insist on something. Um, there's like 130 of them and one of him. Uh, also, there's about 20 million of us and 130 of them. So um, I don't know what it's going to take for them to stand up to him or for us to stand up to them in, a, um, in higher volumes um, and bring Christ and, and God back into their actual belief and actions because they're not behaving like Christ. Like they literally have one job, act like Jesus Christ if you want to be clergy you have one job and you failed miserably so on every level um so the problem is actually coming from the pope and then down to the bishops who are also uh many of them are if not almost all of them are in on covering this up um there was a synod meeting there's an annual synod meeting where uh, the hundred and about give or take five or so 130 uh, members go and meet with the Pope uh, once a year and they discuss all the important matters of the church and it was confirmed to me from reliable sources and bishops themselves that the issue of clergy sexual abuse in Coptic survivor was not discussed at the synod meeting it is not on their agenda to be discussed everyone is to just be silent about it everyone is just to turn a blind eye whatever bishops have abusers in their area um, they've been reinstating them, you know, they could put them on administrative leave to investigate just to shut us up. Um, but they've been relocating abusers. Uh, I've exposed five so far. They're all minus my abuser, uh, Ruiz. That's the only one that's been removed. Um, none of the other abusers have been removed from priesthood. In fact, they're all still priests. They're all still receiving financial support, uh, legal support if needed. Um, church donations are paying for lawyers. I have Samah here. I see she just popped up, turned on her camera. Samah is a prime example of this. Samah is the um, survivor of Pope Tawadros's first cousin, the vicar of uh, over four and a half states, including uh, Northern California um, in the Western region. So that's where he's at. He has power over that area. And he is a rapist. Um, I'll say it before the trial. <laughs> um, I've heard evidence myself and seen evidence myself. Um, and so the way that's being handled is this rapist has been given um, four different legal teams to defend him. The church is paying for all of it. Um, and uh, that's what's happening. And the Pope is allowing it. And um, in addition, after he was investigated, just like all the other abusers are investigated, if the so-called investigators, which are um, uh, assigned by Pope to address to investigate these things, if they do find the abuser guilty, they, um, and this happened in some ass case, they are um, fired or canceled, or uh, in the case of the 
North American Archdiocese under Bishop David, that entire um, committee just quit. Actually, they all resigned when they saw that Pope Tawadros was not willing to actually allow um, for investigations to be conducted properly. And according to the policy that was written by the North American Archdiocese that was approved by Pope Tawadros publicly as a PR stunt, um, yeah, that policy that they took nice pictures, Bishop David and his priest buddies and, uh, you know, showed the world, hey, we have a policy now, Pope Tawadros approved it, here's a photo to prove it. That policy is not in effect. Um, and the uh, committee did resign after um, the Antonios Betty case went to them and then was taken away from them by Pope Tawadros and assigned a new committee. <laughs> Once that committee found him um, not innocent, I'll say, uh, they were canceled as well. And then Pope Tawadros just had a letter, a very vague letter issued by the abuser Betty's church saying that he is to um, return to service effective immediately and that he was found innocent by the courts and the district attorney. And um, yeah, there wasn't even a case that had even started yet. So how could he have been found innocent? Um, just a bunch of lies. And then mm -hmm. um, this is the reason why Samet had to go get an attorney is actually her rapist tried to sue her for defamation with the church's mm -hmm. money, mm -hmm. with church donations from cops. So um, that's why she ended up having a civil lawsuit filed against him. The courts have accepted it and it is moving forward to trial in 2023. I mm -hmm. did post about that. Um, so now uh, Coptic Survivor has started an organization. Part of our plan is to, I mean, we've we offer support to survivors, mental health and legal. That's the goal. Uh, we want to hold abusers accountable. So we will keep pushing for these priests to be removed. And hopefully we have um, more cops join the movement and start really helping us uh, on the ground wherever they are in the world to maybe boycott. Um, maybe we stop attending services. Maybe we stop sending donations to the Coptic church until they stop paying rapists and stop paying to cover up for them. Um, uh, until today, uh, there can't be any accountability until there's an apology until today. I personally have never received an apology ever. Uh, Pope Tawadros actually went on TV and commented on my case saying that um, a bunch of lies about how we were fine and we were communicating fine and I just went nuts and pretty much went on social media for no reason and um, I uh, there was no apology actually I was insulted if anything and mocked uh, by mm. our Pope um, who mm. did sign off that my abuser did in fact abuse me and many others. Um, mm. There's a lot more to come. Um, a lot more mm. abusers need to be exposed. We, <clears throat> we have bishops, monks, priests, mm. uh, Coptic leaders. Um, and mm. I, the closest we've had accountability was um, a Coptic uh, man that was posing as a counselor, a church counselor, and the church did uh, have him approved and did um, give him a platform and did send young girls to him. <clears throat> Um, for counseling. He was never even a counselor and they never really vetted him. Um, he just got sentenced to life in prison um, after uh, his a small group of his survivors came forward and reported him and went through a very public uh, trial in Egypt. So we're, we still have a long way. Um, I hope that answers your question, John. And you said you have one more question, and then we have Ahmed and Sarah as well. John? Hello? Yeah. yeah, sorry. Thank you, Sally. So just to kind of uh, circle back to the, the point where you said that uh, the Pope put together a committee of bishops and priests and so forth. So my priest actually happens to be one of those priests that was on a committee. Mm. And he said, well, they were asked to come up with like the rules and regulations for like case of abuse, so forth. So they put that together. This is, he told me this, he said, we put it together, we're ready to kind of like 
enforce it, ready to go, like use, you know, these standards and so forth. And then I guess the minute they came across the Pope's cousin, that's when they were told, like, shut it down. And then I asked them, I was like, well, what happened? Like, did you resolve? Did you get anywhere? Like, no, nah, nothing. You just said shut it down and that was it. And yeah. he's like, I don't understand um, what the deal was, but he's like, we put all this time, energy, put it together and then um, came across the cousin and it was like, nope, shut that whole thing down. What was the cousin's priest name again? The priest's name is Antonios Bei. Antonios oh, okay, yeah. Moheb Bei, and he is from Zazit, Egypt, and he does have... That's the Pope's cousin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he does have um, multiple victims. He, oh, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things, and this is shocking, and once this, these stories start coming out, even uh, my best friend, he said he went out to California, and if, if this wasn't a story coming from my best friend, and he had never shared it with me until, like, your stuff got posted... I would have said, you know, if it was anyone else that was sharing the story and it wasn't my best friend, I would say, this is made up. No possible. He said he went out to visit California. You know, he was uh, 21 years old and uh, spent the night at a priest's place who had a fit wife, kids and stuff. And the priest in the middle of the night, at like 3 a.m., jumped into bed with him. Like, and was doing like, all, like, I mean, I can't even discuss her. I was like, this is completely outrageous. Can I ask and he's you? like, yeah. Yeah, and he's like, yeah, this priest just, continued on he's like i was like did they remove it's like no there were lots of things. i was like this is complete insanity did you say so california california you're yeah. referring to anthony hannah the priest there yeah oh yeah 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 one day oh. um he ran down the steps because we were living together he ran down the steps he's like oh my god they got him they got him I'm like got who he's like dude that priest i was telling you he's like dude the guys the guy's been abusing tons of people and they finally like busted him it, this was years years later i mean he was like in his mid thirties, by the time this guy kind of came around to being discovered or whatever, or whatever. So, I mean, I completely believe this stuff. It just, it was hard to believe initially that our church would kind of be uh, involved with all that. Uh, can I ask you, and I don't know if you could name a name, but is there any Bishop from your personal opinion, Sally, who was championing your cause bravely that you can name? No. Not one. No. And the whole Holy Senate knows about this situation. I mean, if regular lay people don't know, I'm sure the whole Senate. So um, not one bishop you can attest to said, you know what? I'm standing up for you. We may not get anywhere, but I'm going to stand up for you and I'm going to champion your cause. And I'm going to, you know, you, oh, oh, not one. Not one, actually. The only wow. there's only been one priest really that did that, and um, he was is, he out. In, was he out in Chicago? No. No, sir. There was only one priest that did that. Um, uh, everyone knows Father Bishoy Salama is my father and friend in this movement, and um, oh, where's he from? Toronto. Uh, He's actually. Um, is yeah. he Bishop he's David's only, brother? He is Bishop yeah. David's brother, and he's the only um, wow. Coptic clergyman in the entire world that has truly mm. and faithfully put his life and his um, priesthood on the line mm. uh, for me and, 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 other and, survivors. and he and he's gotten nowhere. Um, no, actually, um, mm. I mean, there's not much he can do publicly right now um sure. you will find and, out more will be uncovered in the near future and, um, and i don't mean to, i don't mean to monopolize all the time so just real quickly sally one last thing uh if you don't mind um and this is difficulty for me and i'm sure it's exponentially more difficult for you how can we reconcile our church leaders behavior to ignore and cover up with our church leaders biblical teachings and sermons <clears throat> I mean, how do you go about doing that? I mean, like, or how do we go about doing that? Like, all right, that, this is going yeah. on, but ignore that. And okay, so let's get back to the Bible and what Christ is teaching us. But don't worry about this stuff. How do you, it becomes difficult to reconcile the two um, with regards to, you know, our Coptic faith. Uh, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of verses um, and parts of the Bible that, 
are shouting, <laughs> um, not just saying words, shouting at the church to correct themselves. Um, the book of Revelation, I, the book of Revelation, I just read um, for the first time thoroughly, and pretty much the entire thing is addressing the churches. It's a letter to the churches from God um, mm. about their wrongdoing and their corruption, and that they need to hurry up before the time is mm. done. Um, also, um, can't ignore the fact that the very next morning after the laicization decree was written uh, to remove my abuser from priesthood, um, the gospel reading was Matthew chapter 18, um, verse six says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be thrown in the depths of the sea. So this is referring, this is actually Jesus Christ saying, if anyone harms his children, they should just go kill themselves. There's end of story. <laughs> That's it. So um, before you even think about harming a child, go kill yourself. I, that should be a strong enough message um, to our churches and to our leadership. And they've chosen to ignore it. And I don't know what the heck they plan on doing when the end comes. Um, they, there's no way to justify their actions or inactions um, in any, I don't think in any God's or religion's eyes. So um, yeah, I also wanted to, gosh, there was something else I wanted to mention. It'll come back to me. Um, but yeah, I hope that answered your question, John. Can we just move on to a couple more? Thank people? you so very much for taking sure. that time out and explaining things uh, to me and kind of updating me. I really appreciate that, Sally. Sure, John. If you don't, if you'd like, if it's okay, can you reach out to me by email? Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, what's your email? Copticsurvivor at gmail.com. And uh, just okay. yeah, we'll talk a little further about um, what we're discussing now. So thank you. Cool. Sounds um, good. Thank you, Sally. Thanks. Hey, Ahmed, how are you doing? Sorry, you've had your hand up for a while. No worries. Hello, Sally, how are you? Uh, just want to say thank you for everyone for organizing uh, this meeting. It was really, really good. And thank you for all for that. Thank you, Sally, Nina, and Ala. Uh, as you can see, I am, uh, my name is Ahmed. I am Egyptian and I am a Muslim. Uh, so I 100% uh, know what Allah talks about because I have two sisters too, so they experience also what Allah experiencing. I just want just to express some comments about what happens to girls in uh, in Egypt. I'm currently at the UK, but when someone talks to me, we want to visit Egypt and so on, and we want to see it's amazing places. Yes, it's an amazing places, but I give them the hard truth. Egypt is really amazing, but it's not safe for young women. I just give them the plain truth because uh, for young women, uh, before they go out from their house, they have like a whole plan before they go out of their door. What am I going to do? Who am I going to meet? How am I going to survive these hours? God, I want, I want to like spend this day go safely without any stuff that can make me like sad mentally or emotionally or so on. So it's a really big pressure. And just like Alex said, she said that Egypt is like a, a dominant masculinity, but we should add something. It's a dominant toxic masculinity. I don't know why it's like there is a, a huge fight between men and women, especially in Egypt. For example, if someone sees like a woman who's successful, who's independent, who's single, they just feel like their manhood is like threatened and they feel offensive and they start to act aggressively. This is one of the reasons uh, in the mentality of thinking. And the, even if they found like a man who's tried to stand up for women or something, and they will just immediately say, you should be a woman or something like that, which is really unthinkable, it's really strange. Also, if, uh, if a woman got harassed in Egypt or got molested or something and wanted to go to the cops, they will start immediately not treating her as a victim. They will start treating her as the accuser. So and instead of saying to her, why did this happen to you? They will just say, what did you go out of your home? Why are you wearing like this? And blah, blah, blah. And they start pointing issues that are not related to the crime itself. 
So every woman should wear as whatever she wants to wear and everyone should control himself. And if anyone has committed a crime, he should be charged for it, not the other way around. That's one of the main issues. The other issue also, there is a huge pressure and from the families and also from the tradition. For example, if a woman wants to graduate and has her own job and started her own business, that's totally fine and admirable, but their family and other relatives will start pushing every time they meet her. When are you gonna get married? When are you gonna get married? And they start to push. And if a woman tried to like, become much old, like 30, 35, started to come near 40, they will start telling her, no one will look at you, no one will love you. And so women try to make just such rash decisions. My sister is one of them. She became like 37 or something and she wanted to start her own job, but my relative pushed her, no one will look at you and so on and so on. And so she got married with the first one who proposed to her, which it was a poor choice. Uh, because he was like, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the expression, his mama's boy, mm. it, his mama's boy. So anything, anything that happens, he goes immediately and tells his mama anything, even personal. He just calls his mom and tells her, what should my wife make for lunch today? Even in the personal stuff, he just shares it with his mama, which is really bad. And sadly, there is a kid involved now, my niece, she, there is a, a young child. So there is just no possibility for a divorce because it will be bad for the young child. If she was still not pregnant, of course there will be a divorce. And that is uh, one of the baddest issues in Egypt that women is usually uh, treated as, not as a victim, but as the accuser. And one of the main reasons also that people keep doing harassing or molesting even in the streets is because that there are no strict laws preventing that. I know that it's recently that it's coming to change and everything. There are people getting arrested and they're getting, but it was too late. We should have done this early because there are a lot of victims now and there are still a lot of victims. I hear about blackmail of a young girl and who committed suicide and so many bad issues that happen for women. Yeah. And I heard yeah. also about the Fairmont case hotel whose accusers are, they have a sentence for life, but most of them are on the run now. Some of them are already here in the UK and till now they still haven't been caught, which yeah. is a really yeah. bad. So what I'm proposing is that we change the mentality. I'm here in the UK at the moment. When I go in the street, I see that the young women, they are wearing whatever they want. Even they are wearing like, uh, like skirts and everything. But I can see that no one is approaching them. No one is trying to do anything because I know that there is a law. Anything you will do, you will be caught and you will be prosecuted. I wish that was in Egypt. If it was there, I'm not saying that the UK doesn't have any molestation or any rape. The, yes, it does. But in the street, I don't have, see what happens in Egypt. In Egypt, you can see molestation, you can see harassment in the middle of the day, not in the night, no, in the middle of the day, which is really bad. And the most thing is that the people on the street, they just start seeing, they are not engaging, they are not defending. They just start to look from outside, from far away and then just continue with their day, which is really bad. These are the points that I wanted to just to share. I'm not really sure if it happens in anywhere else, but I know that in Egypt, it, uh, the situation is really bad. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed. That's uh, interesting that you mentioned toxic masculinity. Our last talk last month actually was about toxic masculinity and we did touch, touch on a lot of the things that you did just cover now. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, join the movement. We're, we're in it. Social media apparently is the move. So um, thank you, Sarah. Bullis. Hey everyone, I um, actually had a couple of comments. I'll try to be brief uh, to respect everyone's time, but um, it's kind of going back to what John was saying about you know this the belief that a lot of our friends and family members hold like this is not a Coptic thing, rape in the church is a Catholic thing. That belief comes from uh, believing that that happened in the Catholic Church because their priests are not married and. I just had a really good conversation and challenged that because I just want you all to be armed with information. The position of power, like priesthood, like teacher, like coach, attracts abusers. 
So this is not a Catholic church issue. This is a power issue. This is the, the attractive position of a priest is the abuse of power. Not all priests, of course, but this is why it's a Coptic issue and any position of power issue. That's number one. Number two, I don't know if everyone is aware of this, but it is something for Copts to know. The church's position per the Pope's representative, he came out and said, the church believes of not um, getting rid of the priest. The church is willing to forgive the priest as God forgave David. <laughs> David was not accused of raping children. David was accused of sexual immorality. There is a difference. So if you're confused about the Coptic church position, feel free to go and listen to the Pope's rep speak about it. He was very clear. Okay. That's number two. And number three, for everyone on the call, this is Sarah's. This is not sanctioned by Sally or anybody. This is what I think that we can do if you would like to support this movement. We have to understand that this is years of abuse and it's not going to change overnight. It will take a long time. Just don't give up the fight. Give it to your children. Don't give up. We're all strong women and we can carry that baton all the way to the end. But the things that we all can do, one, withhold donations because those donations are defending rapists. Number two, donate to Sally because those donations are su supporting survivors. Talk to your priests, make sure they know your displeasure with this. Talk to your friends and your family, share the thing because all the church is doing is silencing this. So if you take this and you talk to your friends and you talk to your family in a safe space where you're not judging them, where you're not making them the enemy, where you're having dialogue about how this is destructive to them and their future generations, you can garner support. And the more support we have, the further we can go. And that, that's, that's all I have. But we, we, have, we have power. There is a lot more of us. We might not have the power to change it today, but if we keep that attitude, we can definitely change this. So thank you, Thank Sam. you, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, who's the Pope's representative and where can I listen to what you mentioned? I, I saw it, it was linked and at that time is in a YouTube. I will see if I can find it, it's forwarded to Sally and maybe we can share it on social media. And what's the name of the representative? I have it on, I've posted it and shared it on Facebook at some point, I think. Um, gosh, I can, uh, I'll try to find the link while we're talking and share it in the chat here. Um, he oh, did okay. say that we give, uh, we give the priest five, 10, maybe even 20 times um, to repent, meaning he can rape children up to 20 times and we'll forgive him each time. That's sure, but I, I, I mean, I, I think oh. even the most fundamental teaching in our church is uh, forgiveness is one thing. And consequences are another. If I was to go confess to a priest and say, hey, father, I've just murdered three people. He may forgive me, but he's going to tell me to turn myself in and pay the consequence. So and it sounds far fetched that, you know, that would be um, uh, the teaching or the way we go about things, because it just doesn't make sense. It, 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 it sounds like it just doesn't make sense in sexual abuse cases, but everything else, it kind of you know, it makes sense to, to forgive, but the person would have to pay consequences. But for some reason, in this case, it's just, with sexual abuse, it's completely flipped yeah. over upside down. It makes no, no sense. A factor that we might not see. And again, this is my opinion. <laughs> I think we forget that the church is not so open to forgiving women. Okay. If a woman committed sexual immorality, she would be excommunicated in a heartbeat. I don't know how the church is treating male victims. I'm sure no better than female victims, but the case of we forgive priests, I think if a, a Sunday school teacher, a woman Sunday school teacher was found to be having intercourse with her kids, I, I, am, I am sure the church would deal with that with an iron fist. So. You know, the church is very lenient on women issues and, and stands with men. And that's because we have a patriarchy and we need 
more women on boards and we need more women to be part of the Senate and we need all that. But again, that's a conversation for another day. I'm not trying to open Yeah, I, I see that. And uh, by the way, when I was referring to forgive, I meant like uh, personally in confession, not like a forgiveness, like publicly for an act. I meant, uh, uh, you know, uh, forgiveness with regards to, you know, repentance and confession. But I yeah. see what you're saying. Thank, thank you. I will say, thank John, you. what what Sarah was talking about helped because I'm on this Zoom because of her like gentle encouragement. And to Sally's point earlier, like there's so many more lay people than there are people making decisions, right? It's like millions of us to hundreds of them. And there are a lot of people who are on board with addressing and creating a system, what we talked about earlier, and putting steps into place to prevent things from happening as best we can sure. and um, this may be but we're not voicing that for various reasons but gently encouraging people to like get involved i think eliminates the legwork that organizations that cop like copter survivor have to do to like create traction because the numbers speak for themselves if that makes so, sense um, thank you I'm, I'm sure there's an answer to this next question i'm going to ask but um i i guess your first reaction or line of thinking would be, well, let me go report it to the church because they're going to back me up and stand with me because this is evil. But once you found out that that wasn't the case, why wouldn't you just take it immediately to the police and bring criminal charges against these priests? Now, I don't know if statutes of limitations had to run out or, you know, which state a lot of these abuses had occurred in, but why not say, all right, fine, you're not going to help me. Let's do it the hard way, which is let's press charges and bring criminal charges against um, these, uh, 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 you know, uh, perpetrators. Um, yeah, John. So actually, um, I believe that the church knows what the statute of limitations is whenever a um, victim reports. And I believe that they go and consult legal and find out how much time they have to shut us up because I believe strongly that that's what happened in my case and the evidence and timeline shows it. Um, I think that's the harsh reality of it. I think that they just find out how, how long do I need to keep this girl quiet until, and then what they do now, like right now, a lot of them, I don't know if they had some sort of conference or mass text they sent out to each other, but a lot of the responses I'm getting from the very ignorant leaders and clergy is, well, why didn't she report to the police? Oh, well, if you want something done, go report it to the police. If the police take action, then we'll take action. Well, we just talked a few minutes ago about the statistics and percentages of um, abusers that are actually held accountable. And it's very, very, very difficult. You know, I can't just walk in and report to the police and all of a sudden they go arrest my rapist. It doesn't work that way. Um, there's a lot that goes into um, filing charges against an actual abuser and finding a court or a district attorney that will actually do that. Um, yeah, so the church knows that they have a very, very, very high chance of getting away with it, even if we report it to the police. So that's what they're hiding behind now. They're hiding behind the law, which is what Nina talked to us earlier about. This is what enables abusers and institutions to carry this bullshit on, excuse my language. Um, yeah, um, I think we are, we are, we've just hit two hours and six minutes. So I know Egypt is falling asleep. <laughs> um, Vivian, we will take you next and then Alette. Thank you so much. I won't take too much time. I know we're over. Um, I want to say thank you to all the survivors who spoke today. And I want to also share that my name is Vivian Salahanna. I'm Coptic and I'm also a professor of criminology. Um, and I've been studying social movements <laughs> and I've been working inside prisons and with victims of violence for two decades. And early in my life, uh, like as a person who was a, a young adult, I really struggled inside the church because I found them to be so conservative <laughs> and I just am not, I've never been. Um, and I look back now and I'm just so overwhelmed. Sally, I just learned about what the work that you've been doing in the last like month and a half, maybe. So I just stumbled into this because to be honest, I don't stay fully immersed in the Coptic world for too long. <laughs> I have a really hard time with that world. Um, and I've, it's just blown my mind because even as a person who's dedicated her life towards justice and like transformative justice, not 
penal system, not just the prisons and the police, because we know how harmful that system is. And I can talk about that in relation to being Coptic at some point with you separately. But I want to say, like, even as a person who's dedicated her life to studying harm reduction and violence and, and finding true paths to justice, it still blows my mind that I didn't see all of this in the church directly. And now as I'm talking with my cousins and my friends and all of the conservative people in my life about it, I'm just like screaming through texts because it's like the culture of secrecy, the haram and aid cultures, like everything was haram and aid, it didn't matter what it was. If you were a woman, it was gonna be haram that you did it or said it, you know? Even just saying things, like just verbalizing certain ideas in the church was so heavily clamped down upon. And so when I think back to how being young in Canada was so heavily problematic in the Coptic church, like anything that you did as a young person was considered absolutely dangerous for your well-being. You couldn't be with people who weren't Coptic. You couldn't talk to people who weren't Coptic about what it was like to be Coptic. Like there was like the auntie police who always knew where you were and called your mother and told you, you know, you're, where she You're literally you. defining a cult right now. But can it's it, carry on. Cultish, right? It's like this also diaspora culture where are my parents lived in 1960s Egypt when they left. And they were raising us in 1990s Canada. And so their idea of what is Egyptian stopped in the 60s. But they, we were trying to manage being in Canada as young people in the 90s. And I think, I mean, culture in general can be cultish. So I don't also want to call my Coptic culture a cult. But I do want to say that within the church, I am starting to realize how deeply socialized we become towards sexual violence. Like this culture of secrecy and this clampdown on sexuality and this obsession with our virginities and what we were wearing. Um, and how much power the priest had over our young lives. I didn't personally experience sexual violence in the church. Um, but I'm looking back now and realizing that there's so much work for us to do on the ground, just so that we can create the communities of safety for young people, especially. And like, and I do think that what you're doing connects so heavily with the LGBTQ movements and like the church's relationship to sexuality has to be addressed. Um, I have so much to say, Sally. I need to contact you separately, I know. And I'm just really grateful for what you're doing. I've come to, this is the second workshop I've come to that you've done. Um, and I feel like I've been preparing for this my whole life without knowing it. So I'm here for you. Um, Ala, your story speaks to me on so many levels as well because sexual violence exists across so many societies. And I just wanna say to everybody, like as someone who grew up in Canada and now lives in the States, Sexual violence here is endemic. It is just as bad as it is anywhere else. So I want to be really careful about really like pegging our own people as being more violent than other people, because I know for a fact that Europeans and white Americans are just as like violent and sexually violent as our, our people are. So I also want to kind of decolonize the conversation a little bit and push us to be critical of the police force that has a long history and culture of rape. I mean, what's happening in Canada right now around Indigenous people's struggles, what we know about the police force. So to just encourage us to be more critical, to continue to support survivors through whatever means they want to take towards justice, but to also learn from so much of the work that's been happening in regards to fighting sexual violence and patriarchy, which is always rooted in heteropatriarchy. Um, and just to put so much love into this work with you, Sally and Mala. Thank you all so much. Sally, you're muted. <sighs> oh, hi. Thank you. I said, Vivian, thank you so much. Um, yeah, go ahead and email me. My, my email is copticsurvivor at gmail.com. Just please bear with me, y'all. I do my best to um, reply as fast as I can. It is, um, my inboxes are overwhelming and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Um, Alette. Unmute, Habibi. Yeah, um, um, well, I raised my hand for this long to ask you if I can leave because I'm falling asleep and uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm only three hours away from waking up. I'm so, so sorry. Okay. It's all right. It's yeah. Right. But I enjoyed listening in. Uh, Vivian, the last one who spoke, thank you so much. It's not about uh, Middle Eastern uh, countries, 
And it's not only America and the United States, and it's not only the UK, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's common everywhere, but differently. So same, same, but different. So uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A million thank you for everyone. And uh, I would love to talk to you again and again, and we keep on talking about this, but I have to go now. And please, please, please try to make it earlier next time, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing, Ella. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for listening. Yeah. Have by a lovely way, Sally, your uh, link didn't work, by the way. Yeah, I'm work. trying to send okay. you guys another link. Okay, um, cool. Yeah, I don't know why. Um, but if you, if y'all go to, um, let me see. Gosh, where is it? If y'all go to my Facebook page, um, I think August, like mid-August, I believe, is when it was posted. If you can't find it on the link I'm about to send now. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, and the reason why this is the time is because we, I know we have people that join from Sydney, so it's 8 a.m. for them when we start. It is uh, 11 p.m. when we start for Cairo, and it's 1 p.m. when we start in uh, Pacific time in California. So we were trying <laughs> um, as much as we can to accommodate everybody's time. Does anyone have any last minute questions? I know we were supposed to have a breathing break like a while back. <laughs> so anyone need a deep breath, please take one. Um, I'd love for this conversation to continue, but I think what we what I'm hearing from y'all is maybe we need some kind of like a, another meeting, like a Coptic survivor type of um, allies support group or something maybe. So we can talk about what the issues are that are standing in our way and, um, and how we can move forward. So um, I'll try to put something together with the team. I know for the first Coptic survivor community series, I just did a Coptic survivor update and I went over a lot of these things. Um, you can catch up on the Coptic Survivor YouTube channel uh, if uh, for the Coptic Survivor Community Series events that we have. Um, this one will be up on there as well. Um, let me see. I don't know if this link is going to work for you guys. Um, Sally, I think what I would love to see us do is like um, a meeting where we talk about like putting action items that we can send out to the community of people that want to help so it could be like you know kind of what you're describing allies but also kind of come up with like three uh, things everyone can do like in their own home wherever they are in the world so just food for thought yeah, yeah. Um, uh, just, sorry sally just speaking personally i'll tell you that one of the ways one of the reasons that prevented me from engaging is how it's overwhelming and i know it's I am not experiencing anything compared to the overwhelm that you experienced, but it like hearing trauma after trauma, experience after experience, maybe won't help people engage as much as what Sarah is saying as like action items. I think finding, okay, what can we do? What steps, what is in our control? Cause we can't heal, I guess, other people. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's uh, I'll get with, y'all and we'll try to plan something in the near very near future to discuss this further um i found another link i don't know if this works for you guys it's on father bishoy salema's uh, Facebook page. Uh, yeah, yeah. sorry so hopefully that works for y'all um yeah uh just check out anything on my facebook or instagram from july 12th, 2020 until now is related to Coptic Survivor and is probably evidence or something important uh, and videos of this stuff that uh, you guys might want to catch up on. So um, I also want to point out Dina did comment earlier and I think it's important to mention also I know a lot of people already left but um, she said keep in mind that a lot of victims are too traumatized to face their abuser in court which is another reason why they don't report um, within their time frame of the statute of limitations. So uh, she also said there's women who get their rape kit done and don't go to court because they haven't healed enough within the time frame of the statute of limitations. 
Um, so I can tell you that me myself going through a sexual assault trial as a victim and a witness to my own crime um, was really, really, really tough. It really derailed me. I was in the middle of uh, the doctor of pharmacy program at FAMU and um, it, it did derail me for many years and I did end up graduating late. I did graduate, thank God, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it is a enormous disruption in your life, in your mental state, in your peace, in your soul and everything. And then at the end, the end result, you're never even guaranteed to get justice. I certainly did not. Um, so I understand the pain of other survivors that uh, struggle with the same thing. I always, when survivors come to me and they say, okay, I'm ready to take action. I'm ready to go. I'm like, cool, mental health support first. <laughs> Let's get you with a good therapist first, because this is going to be a journey. Um, I don't like to sugarcoat things for them. I want them to know what to expect. Um, but I will walk through um, whatever steps that Coptic survivors want to take. I will walk those steps with them as much as I am able to, um, and so will our team. So um, thank you all so much for attending. Thank you for your commitment to this. And thank you for two and a half hours of your time. And I hope to see you all next month. This is every first Sunday of every month. Look for the next one. I love you all. Anyone that has any suggestions or um, wants to uh, have a private conversation or get in touch with me privately about anything else, please email me at copticsurvivor at gmail.com. Sending you all love and peace. Sally, I just want to jump in and say thank you so much to Sundus for um, her gallant effort to jump in at the last minute. And uh, we truly apologize for speaking so fast. But truly uh, a great thank you and for all the women who join and support uh, when we come together in, in times like this. Um, I'm always surprised about who's willing to come jump in at the last minute and do things that are outside their comfort zone. So Sondos, thank you so much for all that you did tonight. Thank you, Sondos. Yeah, I'm sorry again. <laughs> we're still learning this system and we're trying the best we can to accommodate everybody in all languages. So Sondos saved the day today with the translation. Thank you so much. Um, and Hanan, we did not even get to our last speaker, but uh, I think that's okay because we do, I think we just need an entire different conversation to discuss the trauma um, of abuse. So Hanan, thank you for your patience and I'm sorry we didn't get to you. Um, uh, again, thank you all so much, um, and I'll see y'all next month. Thank you for your time. Bye. Gina. Let me stop recording. Yeah.